As Catherine said, I'm an occupational therapist and I'm based here in Kerry in the Memory Technology Resource Room. Um, and I suppose one of my main roles is um, looking at how different technology and practical tips can help everyday um, memory difficulties. Um, so today I suppose what we're going to look at is what is memory? How does your memory work? Um, what are the different types of memories we have? A small introduction to brain health and also then looking at different technologies out there to help your memory. So for everybody, memory might be different. So it could be when you think of memory, it could be your to-do list. It could be the first time you had a dance with your partner. It could be playing a football match in the rain. It could be an argument you had with a loved one, or it could be remembering what you have to get in the shop later or where you put your keys. And memories could be remembering a word or trying to say it or remembering a phone number, facts and figures. So what is memory? It is a complex function. There's no such thing as normal memory. Everybody has a different capacity. Um, one person might be able to remember somebody's name, but another person finds they can't recognize their face, or it could be the opposite, that somebody recognized faces and not the person's name. The most important thing is that don't compare yourself or your memory to anybody else's. Every person has a different type of memory and has strengths and weaknesses. So this is just a nice little quote. Life is all memory, except the one present moment that goes by you so quickly, you hardly, hardly catch it going. And I suppose what that thinks is, it's really important for our concentration and attention. And I'll explain it a little bit later on, but to be able to attend and concentrate to things are so important for your memory and to be able to recall things. Why? So it's a four step process to think about of how we remember things. We retrieve information, information on an unconscious level and bring it into our conscious mind at will. So this means we perceive information, we take in information from our environments through our sight, smell, touch, hearing, taste. We then have to encode the information. So we have to convert the information into a form that we'll be able to hold and store it into our short-term memory. So our short-term memory, some people think that it could be a few days in length. It actually is between 90 seconds and three minutes before something is stored from our short-term memory into our long-term memory. The fourth step then is retrieving the information. So you recall the information that's stored in the long-term memory. If you have memory difficulties, it can be at any point of these four, four steps that can cause the breakdown. So let's take an example. Let's look at remembering where you put your glasses. So it's like the case, if anybody wears glasses, they could be on your top of your head and you don't know where they go. Or it could be the keys, you put them down on the table and you can't find them. So to perceive the information, we need to see the location that we put the glasses or we need to touch the, the place we put them or we need to be able to hear the sound of them going onto the table. We then register the information through encoding it, okay? And um, we must be paying attention and concentrating. When we do things on autopilot, we're not aware of where we put them. We then need to store this information to retrieve it at a later date. So if somebody starts talking to us, and we get distracted or we see something on the telly while we're doing it, that can break our attention. And then once we have those three steps done is to recall it later on, where did you put your glasses or where did you put your keys? 
So understanding your memory. There are several different types of memories. And what do each one do? So our working memory is our short term memory. We use this to store information for short periods. So perhaps it is following a conversation or following instructions that we might have read or heard. It's like your brain's little scratch pad where it puts information while it decides whether it's not needed for the future. It's important for learning and remembering information that is new. So always when you're learning something new, your short term memory is working. The rest of our memories are long term memories. And so episodic memory is used to recall past events in the recent or distant long ago. These memories are often used to recall emotions and senses. Um, so remembering an anniversary, a birthday, a wedding day, some party that you might have had, or it could be an event of meeting your friend for coffee last week. The next memory is your semantic memory. So to use this um, is, means you're for words and facts. If you're having difficulty with your semantic memory, it means you might have difficulty with finding the right word for things when you're talking to somebody. It also could be that the word is on the tip of your tongue and you can't get it out. Um, it is also used for facts, figures, remembering passcodes, remembering telephone numbers, definitions, um, the capital cities of countries, things like that. Our perspective memory is then used to remember an appointment or a date or an event in the future. It could be also used to meet a, to, when you're planning for meeting a friend for coffee. It's also used for remembering medication to get into the schedule of things. Your procedural memory then. This involves activities that you learn and that you can do automatically without having to think. So I said, as I said earlier, that autopilot, the things you do out of habit. You use this to complete a sequence of actions in a particular order, such as tying your shoelace or putting on your top or pants on your clothes. You also rely on it when you adapt a new habit for something, um, or if you need to learn something new. So if you were in an accident and you broke your leg, or if something happened and you have to follow a step-by-step -step guidance. So repetition is really important and that's how it becomes into your procedural memory. So there are sense of the ideas of what your memories are, but what can affect your memory? And Catherine mentioned it earlier that particularly with epilepsy, it could be after seizures or your medication, but also if you have another type of infection, a kidney infection, or you're not feeling well in yourself, it can affect your memory. If you have low mood or depression, um, emotional distress can affect our attention and concentration. Our mind might be somewhere else. If you're anxious about things, if we can't focus on remembering things, also if we're worried about forgetting things, that takes away from our attention. Lack of rest, restless, restless sleep. Um, if you've had a recent bereavement, any other noise or distractions in a room can really affect with the processing of different information. There is also the overuse of alcohol will affect your memory. And if you had different vitamin deficiencies or thyroid disorders, it can also affect your memory. And I suppose the important thing is if any of these are occurring, that it is to link in with your doctor or your GP if you're experiencing them. And just to see if it is affecting your memory, to be aware. So there can be different ways we react as well to having memory difficulties. One, it can be very upsetting if you have memory loss. 
um, when it becomes a frequent and it's infecting your day-to-day -day routines. For some people, it might cause frustra frustration and annoyance and they might take it out on themselves. It might take longer to do things than before of daily activities. It can knock your confidence. It can make us easily anxious. And other people might react to it by laughing and joking. So we have all different ways we react to it. And it's okay to feel a certain way. But it is about then putting the strategies in place to help our memory. So if there's any tip I can give you today, try not to worry yourselves about your memory or get frustrated or annoyed at it because it will stop you from being able to retrieve the information. It takes away your attention. And it is the hardest thing to try not to do, to worry as it, or get annoyed because it's our natural reaction. So how do we keep our memory well? There's five steps, they say, for memory, memory wellness in research. Physical activity. And that doesn't have to be always going out for a walk. It could be chair-based exercises. It could be dancing. It could be anything that you enjoy doing. Eating a well-balanced diet is really important. Taking care of your heart. Being mentally challenged to your brain. So what that means is it doesn't mean that you have to start doing quizzes or have to start doing um, Sudoku, anything like that, unless you enjoy them. But it's trying to have a different routine for every day. Routine is really important, but it is trying to bring something new in every so often. Social engagement is also really important. So getting out, meeting people. And I know over the last two years, this has been a, a big challenge for people. It doesn't have to be face to face. So it can be over the screen like this. And I should say that mentally challenging your brain, this screen and learning how to do it is mentally challenging as it is. So it could be something like that. And um, ringing people that you haven't spoken to in a while. That social engagement, getting out to the shop, meeting people in the shop. It doesn't mean that you have to go into a crowded area meeting people. It can be one on one, but it is one thing that can stimulate our minds. So what can you do if you're experiencing memory difficulties? Um, so in the memory technology resource rooms, we look at practical tips, different devices and technology that might support to promote independence and safety in everyday activities. So there's three different types of technologies. And when you hear technology, a lot of people are probably thinking computer games, laptops, screens, cameras, but it actually could be an aid and a prompt, a low tech piece of device, and I'll go through that, but it might be as simple as a whiteboard. Standalone then is another type of technology, and then there's a telecare system. So the low tech solutions are a checklist at the front door to maybe remind you to bring your keys with you, your wallet. It could be now your face mask if you're going for an appointment that you need it writing out a to-do list. So by writing something down or recording it to yourself and listening it back, it helps gain your attention and your concentration then to be able to recall it. Having your own little memory book as well. It doesn't have to be a diary that you write everything down with. It could be just jotting words down. Having a whiteboard in the kitchen or in the hallway. As I say to people, having your kitchen command center that you know what's going on in the day, you put your bills there, you put your medication there, everything is in that one spot. That it's always there as a prompt for you to be able to see it then during the day. For a lot of these things, by doing them once is not going to be of benefit. You have to keep doing them so they become a habit. And as we said, then it'll turn into your procedural memory. 
it's also sometimes the times that you don't need it is when to start doing it, when it become, can become a habit. Standalone devices then. So these are devices that don't need to be monitored and they can be very helpful. So orientation clocks. And these are clocks that will give you the day, the time and the date on them. If you're doubting yourself in the morning time going, God, what day it is, what time it is, sometimes rather than doubting yourself, having somewhere to turn. A lot of people turn on the news to find out the date and the time in the morning times, or they wait till they get their, the daily paper. It could be going online to see it, or if anybody has Alexas and Googles, that's another option to use. Um, other memory aids are you can get medication reminders, and you'll see them in the, the corner there. There's an automatic medication dispenser. And I suppose they don't suit everybody, and there's different types out there. Um, and that's one thing I, I say that some technologies suit some people and not others. Um, so really have a think before you go to buy it. And if you do have any questions on different types of technologies out there, you, I'll pass on my details that you'll be able to contact me and we can link you into different services. Um, the other ones are safety devices. So if people might have people calling or worried about losing keys when they're out, it could be a key safe at the front or back door. Another thing could be if you get up at night time, having a motion sensor light that turns on to prevent a fall. Um, if it affects your sleep and you can't leave the light on, it's really important to have good lighting around the house. Another thing you'll see there are the photo telephones. It's always when you need to ring somebody in an emergency, you can't remember their number, it's fight or flight. So having their face there can be easier to ring. The third type then of technology out there are called telecare systems. And these systems are used to monitor an individual in their own home environment. Um, it has to be with their consent. So if an emergency happens, it can be easily detected and responded to. A lot of people might have seen the pendant alarms that you might wear on your wrist, which is a button. And then if anything happens, you can press the button. Or it could be that it's a sensor, at the falls detector, a bed chair alarm sensor, and it triggers then a signal to the base unit, which is connected either through a SIM card, a mobile phone, or a landline, which will contact then the monitoring center or a carer. If you touch off these by accident, that's okay. You just tell the center it was an accident. You don't need help or you don't need them to contact people. It's whatever way you've agreed with your family um, and yourself with the contract with the provider. So what are the benefits of technology to your memory? So they can promote independence and autonomy, improve confidence and quality of life, help manage potential risks in and around the home, help with memory and recall, support engagement in meaningful activities. Some GPS technologies and monitoring systems can enhance the feeling of safety with less fear and anxiety, provide reassurance to carers, and help to feel less stressed and can be used to provide useful information for planning care. But it also has their limitations. So for many devices, they do require supervision if not required for maintenance. So for example, batteries run out. Are you gonna to remember to check the batteries or who's, are you gonna have batteries in stock? It doesn't provide perfect solutions and it doesn't replace the need for care sometimes as it will not eliminate all risks it can only assist in improving safety and well-being the use of devices that monitor people or that allow someone else to track them can raise ethical issues so it's important that the people are aware of them before they agree to start using items such as gps systems so I suppose one thing to take as well, 
please don't worry if you don't remember that and any information there um i'm sure i'll make this presentation and you'll have the recording to go back on over as well and um, remember worrying is like sitting in a rocking chair it gives you something to do but it doesn't get you anywhere 